Once again, welcome everyone to the 2022 Planetary Health Annual Meeting at Harvard University. This morning, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome our opening keynote for this day. It is Hindu Umaru Ibrahim, who is an expert in the adaptation and mitigation of indigenous peoples to climate change. She is a member of the Mboro Pastoralist People in Chad and president of the Association for Indigenous Women and Peoples of Chad. Amoro Ibrahim is an advocate for the greater inclusion of indigenous people and their knowledge and traditions in the global movement to fight the effects of climate change. Hindu received the Pritzker Emerging Environmental Genius Award and was appointed as a United Nations Sustainable Development Goals advocate. In 2019, she was listed by Time Magazine as one of 15 women championing action on climate change. Hindu is also a member of our Planetary Health Alliance Advisory Board, and we are grateful for her participation and her guidance, and welcome Hindu. Over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to be with you, even virtually. Today I'm calling you from Sharm El Sheikh, where the COP27 started. Uh, the preparation meeting. And of course, I'm in the preparatory meeting of the indigenous peoples and the local communities. That is happening four days before that we start the COP, of course, the head of state and then the negotiations. But today, I'm not only happy to talk to you about the important issues that we are fighting all and standing for it, the planetary health. But because today, as we all are engaged to create solution for a better planetary health, there is some concern. I'm feeling very pessimistic about our planet health and our capacity to take decisions that are really needed. We are not acting fast enough. And this is a big concern if we are caring about our planet, we are caring about the health of us and all the biodiversity surrounding us. So firstly, on climate change, we all know that 2022 has been a terrible year for the climate impact. There is no single week that passes without a disaster. And we have been more impacting than ever in each country. We all know how it's happened around the floods in Pakistan, in Central Africa, and even in my home country, just to before to come here, our home flooded to one and 20 meters higher. So people's becoming homeless. That is never happened because for us, we think we are in a dry area, but no supply, surprising that we get the flood, flooding all the city and even our home. We all saw the fire in Europe the terrible drought in East Africa, just like next door, where the food insecurity becoming a problem of more than 20 plus millions of peoples. But the scary part is, people seems to just to see all these drama, dramas going around as normal. This is very scary for me. So, we all know also from the COVID pandemic, all the emission becoming very high and we are taking that as normal. So is that we are living in a normal life or we have to take the action? Because we, when we see France, we see the other country like Germany, they are going back to the coal mine because they think that they need more energy for heating. So is that the coal mine who can give people more energy? So for me, I'm thinking like last year during the COP in Glasgow, the developed countries coming to face out all the call. But the last data is showing us the opposite. This is the part that we need all to stand and work on it on the climate change. We cannot just fight for the solution. And then in the other hand, regress and encourage those who are impacting more our climate. The second is on the biodiversity. I am also very concerned by the preparation of the next COP of biodiversity that will happen in Canada. This negotiation on how to deal with the biodiversity crisis is led 
it's supposed to be concluded by 2020. And we are now in the 2022, and we are not even close to a deal for Montreal. And it is the same time we see our ocean are dying, our forests burning, our all agriculture is going through to the industrialized to grab the land to make us and hunger again. This has a real concern in our daily life. In my communities, for example, as we are a nomadic pastoralist in the Sahel, we are seeing all this urgency touching our cattle, touching our home. The deforestation and the land grabbing forcing people to leave their home, to find just to, to get access to a water point. And people are increasing all these crises between them and the conflict become like a normal thing among a pastoralist fisher peoples or farmers peoples because the resources are shrinking. The biodiversity is losing. The water who's supposed to be accessible for all the peoples becoming a resources of conflict. How we can accelerate the problem? Are we a solution sol solvers or are we like a, a, pro a problem makers? So I'm so sorry to say so, but I don't see hope in these negotiations at the international level where the communities are going under flood, drought, and all the issues that are following. Seven years ago, at the international level, we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. The objective was clear, eradicate poverty and save the planet. And we have to do that by 2030. But it is also a failure because the poverty is everywhere from developed to the developing countries. Climate change increased poverty, warm and conflict at the international level increased poverty, threat food insecurity in all the African countries. So I am certain on one thing, hope is can come only from the communities because it's not coming from our leaders. Our government are not doing the effort enough to take us through the hope door. Last year in Glasgow, they committed about 20 billion US dollars to save the forest. They committed 1.7 billion for the indigenous people's support. But the question is, where is the money? It's all ending as an empty promises. That's why the hope is not from them. The hope can come only from the peoples. But how we can get this hope? We need to empower peoples and we need to take what they are doing out. If the government are failing, they should give us the key and we can sit in the driver's seat and let them follow us. At the local level, we have the concrete solution that I wanted to share with you briefly. I see in many countries, the young people that are not anymore protesting, they are all back to the communities, creating the solutions, creating a community organizations where they have leading the small business. They started to do all the solution on the renewable energy, local agriculture, restoring the biodiversity. And that's what is happening in our communities. They are not waiting for the solution outside. They are creating them themselves because they know that they, if they need to make a success, they cannot just follow the talks of the leaders, but they can act themselves. And believe me, that our goal is to help them. We can provide the support financially or technically or giving them knowledge. So then it's not only that giving them, but we need to spend time with those youth peoples to understand their own initiative, to implement those initiatives on the way that they want to do it because we do not have all the same level of understanding how we can implement projects. So then we can understand the way that they wanted to do it, support them on what they are doing, and that can help to prosper the project. But I wanted to share with you what I'm doing concretely. In this year only, I developed two participatory mapping in chat. One was around the forest areas. The second one was around the lecture that you all know who shrink his water from 90%, just over less than one generation, four years 
a go only. So this 2D participatory mapping that I produce is how to help the science knowledge and traditional knowledge come together in order to build a solution on adaptation. One of the examples is how we can gather the traditional medicine because people rely to the traditional medicine in order to heal themselves. Second, how we can manage better the water resources as the water is shrinking. So we do have some water points, but we, we are also expert on knowing how we can manage those water and share them among the co communities to avoid the conflict. The third is traditional weather forecast. Of course, it is easy when you are in developed country or when we have internet with a smartphone to look at the weather forecast for yourself. But for our communities, they observe the bear's migration, the cloud position, they observe the wind direction that help them to just to have the weather forecast daily, weekly, monthly, or years in order to produce the food that they want, to displace the cattle, to build the economy. But let me tell you, what is the participatory mapping? Participatory mapping is listening to the people, listening to the community members, in particular, the women, the elders, the young people, putting them together. Participatory mapping, it is also map the traditional knowledge, ecological traditional knowledge of the environment that are not written in the paper, that the people living in this different ecosystem and knowing those ecosystem and knowing how they can use them. But participatory mapping, it is also engaging conversation with the local authorities, with the communities to found the solution together in order to better share all the knowledge and all the resources together. But within those knowledge in the map, we can also implement a local development strategy that can help the women to get the participation, not only as a checking box, but participating in their own ideas and taking the ideas of the women to implement it with the communities as a woman leaders in their own communities to create also a movement that can encourage young peoples to replant the trees, but to restore also the ecosystem, to follow the orientation of the elders, to learn from the elders, to benefit from their own traditional knowledge that are passing from one generation to another one. It is also to share the information with other communities. For example, as pastoralists, we can share the information with the farmers peoples, to tell them that if the rain going to flood the crops, to just to plant the crops later, or to plant the right crops during the drought. So people are able to make the peace with the nature and learn to collaborate with the ecosystem. This is the message of hope, because when you do uh, uh, protect the nature, you must give it back to the nature. Ecosystems are a shell that help the peoples to deal with the climate impact, but it is also a powerful weapon to fight climate change. So we must use this weapon to fight, restore the ecosystem, fight the climate change by protecting the nature. For instance, in my communities, we have all the Paris agreements on the way because we are using it to, to do our way of living carbon neutral. We have 100% climate and biodiversity positive agriculture that produce carbon neutral milk and meat. So that is what we need to all the peoples to be carbon neutral in their daily life. So if my people who have no access to the school, who do not know how to read, just to succeed on it, the other peoples could do better. If an indigenous grandmother in my community can do it, I am sure that it is something our leaders could also do. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm so happy to give you this keynote and I'm waiting for you for all the responses. In this climate negotiation, I will take the message of the planetary health and that will be my next 20 days of negotiation in Sharm el Sheikh. Thank you so much.
Hi, Hindu. It's Sam. It's so nice to see you, and um, so nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us, even from Sharm El Sheikh. Um, before I, I have a question or two, um, is there anybody else who has a question for Hindu or um, wants to get involved in, in a conversation? Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Um, I see Nicole's hand. I think these, oh, okay, back here. I think the mics work. Is that right? Yeah, so if people have questions, come on up. Uh, Hi, Hindu, and uh, thanks for a great keynote. So the, the last thing, uh, one of the last things can, that can you Can you introduce said, yourself, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. So my name is Nightingale, and uh, I'm uh, from Kenya. And I really appreciate what you, you shared with us. I'm also a mother and a registered nurse. So um, it's the net zero and the production of uh, meat and milk and still being net zero. And that's what I would like to hear a little bit about. Thank you. Sure, Sam, so good to see you. And sorry to do not be in person with you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, sister from Kenya. So the net zero milk and meat is, when you are a pastoralist, you have your cattle, you move from one place to another one to found water and pastures. So we, we stay two days in one place, three days in another place. So that means we are not overgrazing the land. And that means when we are passing, our cow dung fertile the land. So when we do that, and the way that we are coming back, we are maintaining the balance of the ecosystem. So we are not creating the climate impact, but we are restoring the ecosystem. So when you have the meat of our cows or you have the milk of our cows, so they contribute zero to the climate impact, but they help positively to restore the ecosystem, to fight the climate change, because the way of living that we are having is the way of the mitigating the climate change and it's helped the other peoples to also adapt to what we are doing. So that's the meat and milk net zero we already have and produce. Hindu, I have a, a question for you. Um, I think a lot of people in our community are feeling the impatience that you just described and the frustration that, you know, here we are at COP27, the, the name sort of speaks for itself, um, and we're actually not making a lot of progress. And I want to go back to something you said about taking the, the wheel of the car um, and, and driving. And I'm curious um, on the how, how we do that. So the rest of, of today, we're going to have a heavy focus in this meeting on movement building and activism, building power. Um, and there are ways in which I feel like even participating in COP27, there's a risk of being um, sort of uh, marginalized and that I at some point, you know, th there's a need for action, for collective action, for protest. And I'm wondering, you know, as a real leader in the indigenous peoples um, uh, community and movement, um, how you think about movement building, um, what are the potentials for um, bringing indigenous peoples and leaders together, youth leaders together, you know, mothers, faith leaders, um, clinicians and healers um, to um, stand outside of the COP process, um, not to try to be integrated within it, but to actually uh, oppose um, governments and to demand change uh, in a different fashion um, through building power and um, collective action and sort of how much have you thought about that? How much is that an active conversation in the Indigenous Peoples Association that you're part of? Um, and sort of where do you see that going from here? Absolutely, Sam. So I think we all believe more on the people movement than the leaders movement. 
the climate negotiation have 27 years and moving to the 30, but we are still increasing all the climate impact. We are still meeting and the solution are very little. But of course, we need this multilateral space for the government to listen to the voice of the communities and then to also move all collectively. But they are not doing it right at all. So how we can do a force outside? As indigenous peoples, we have the seven socio-cultural regions. Our regions are not based on the UN regions. So we have Africa, Asia, Latin America and Caribbean, North America, Pacific, Arctic, and we have Eastern Europe and Russia. So our regions already are cut it social culturally, adapt to our own ecosystem. So we are meeting all under the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. And this is where is our forces. So we come together with our key messages. We oppose all the decisions that are happening at the COP and we act to make our voices to be here inside the room. If our voices are not heard, we protest outside. But I think this is helpful, but it cannot be helpful if we are not coming all together as citizens, as peoples, as mothers, as women, as youth, as indigenous peoples all together. Why? Because we have the same demand. We wanted to protect our planet, so we must to be all together and come all together. So we started at the COP25 in Madrid. How we did? So the last day of the negotiation, we have no information at all. Even the developing countries have zero information. They was working on the corridors. No one are giving any information. Then the developed countries are meeting among themselves just like trying to hide information. And we gather all together the nine major groups, from the youth to the women, to the farmers, to the indigenous peoples, to the NGOs. We went together to the office of the general secretary. They gather police to just to tell we are not going there. While they see the number is big, they cannot stop us. And then we tell them we are unstoppable. We have to do our people's, plan, people's plenary right now and we gather all together outside of the conference room. We got all the media, all the attention, and we impose our plenary without being in the room with all the different sitting at the UN, but we make our own voices and it get here. From then, we create this movement of coming all together as the nine constituency that representing the real peoples, not like the government who have the mandate from ministry and ministry and etc. So we come all together and we are going to meet and do this power. But the question is, how are we going to split this movement outside of the negotiation to come to the citizen at their home country? So my response is, peoples have a power. Please use your power. You can stand up because you are the one who are voting for those leaders. If they are not acting well for the climate, don't for, vote for them. And if you vote for them, they are not acting. Hold them accountable because you can do that. Maybe in some of the countries we cannot, but those who are in those countries who call it the democracy, please use your force, use your power, come as peoples together and clean the clean planet and healthy planet for all of us. Does anybody else have questions? Yeah. Hi, Hindu. Uh, my name is Heather Castleden. I'm from Canada. Um, I have an impact chair in transformative governance for planetary health. On the first day of, and I really appreciate everything I've heard you say this morning, uh, I'm with you and Mother Earth um, on that one. Um, I guess uh, it's a call to action around this conversation we're having today about movement building and your messages about um, indigenous knowledge systems and drawing on the wisdom of elders. Um, and a comment that I made on the first day was just about recognizing that planetary health is not a new concept. And so it's, 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 a, 
it's a new term that we're using to recognize, I think, um, a very old and, and um, ingrained science from indigenous peoples. Um, and so I guess as a movement building opportunity, this, and I've heard a lot of people come up to me say, you know, thanks for those comments. Um, but I guess it's a call to action that um, for anybody in the room who's publishing in the Lancet Planetary Health, that that's how you start your article, is rather than referring to it as a new science, to recognize where is planetary health, the concepts coming from. It's from an indigenous peoples and their understanding of, of their relationship to the land that they're on. So that's like a, a you know, one small act of, um, I guess, uh, change that, that I, I would encourage our, our group to consider. Another uh, area that I was thinking about around movement building is, um, again, speaking to the Lancet Planetary Health, uh, there's a paywall around trying to access knowledge um, in the academy. And so to, to also push for a journal like that to be freely available to anybody who has access to the internet, to be able to um, access the, the knowledge that we're sharing through these academic journals um, as a way of, of, of breaking down the silos, of not having an ivory tower, that only certain people have access to the knowledge that we're sharing. But again, when you point out the, the piece about using our power, there's a lot of power in this room. You know, people with the MD behind their name, the alphabet soup, et cetera, using that power to amplify the messages that you're sharing today and that we're hearing from uh, many of the people in this, in this conference, um, to remember that when we're writing, when we're speaking, and those kinds of things. So it's a comment, and I just wanted to lift you up for what you brought today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your valuable comments. It's really true. I think planetary health for indigenous peoples, we are not just thinking about human separately and then the rest of the species from the insect or trees or plants separately. We always care about the health in general. We say we are not only part of the nature, we are nature. And that's how we are taking care of each other, us and the rest of the species. So this is the planetary health. So if from the academy, because people trust you from the academy way, then you can put that clearly as indigenous peoples, how we already use to the planetary health, that will be really very, very valuable and helpful. And as you said, from the traditional knowledge and science knowledge, as you have the article, share it through the internet, but share it also through the WhatsApp, because some peoples do not have these channels of the internet. It is a luxury for so many indigenous communities. So then that can help them. One thing that I can add is, I did organize a conference in Chad, by regional conference, Africa and Asian indigenous peoples together, where we talk about the traditional knowledge, how we can take our knowledge holders together. And then we ended up by having, how we can create a safeguard on the knowledge of the indigenous peoples. And I realized, I talked with WIPO, the, uh, the uh, intellectual property organizations in Geneva, they never have anything that to protect the knowledge of indigenous peoples, but they do have something to protect Coca-Cola. So how we can create a safeguard also for the knowledge in order to sustain them. And thank you so much for your comment. Thank you so much, Sam and all the peoples for listening. Thank you so much, Hindu. We really appreciate your taking the time to join us and all of your wisdom. So thank you for being with us today.